It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 10, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. My guest today is Ellen Polishuk from Potomac Vegetable Farms in Virginia in the exurbs just outside of Washington, D.C. As the name indicates, Potomac Vegetable Farms is actually two farms, one right in the middle of suburbia and the other Potomac Vegetable Farms West located out in Purcellville. Ellen's out in Purcellville. The business has been around for about 50 years, but Ellen joined it in the late 1970s, first as a farm worker and later as a manager and co-owner of the farm. Potomac Vegetable Farms runs two farm stands, attends farmers markets in D.C. and has a CSA. We cover a lot of ground in this episode from getting adopted by a farm to egos to composting and cover crops and how to manage your soils and the minerals and the cover crops and the biology all together. I hope you enjoy it and learn as much from it as I did. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by Vermont Compost, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. We're also sponsored by Audible. Discover the world of audiobooks and absorb yourself in the latest business management texts, farming essays, or just relax with all three volumes of The Lord of the Rings. Get a free audiobook download and a three for 30 day trial at audibletrial.com slash farmer to farmer. Welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast, everybody. I'm so pleased to introduce my guest today, Ellen Polishuk from Potomac Vegetable Farms. Ellen, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Hi, Chris Blanchard. Nice to be here. We're so glad that you could join us today. I know it's, um, I mean, it's not being very spring-like here in Northeast Iowa right now, but your guys are kind of springy out there in Virginia. We had a few days of spring, but now it's uh, 49 degrees and drizzling, so it's a good day to be inside. Good day for the peas. Yeah, (laughs) if if we'd have planted them. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So um, I was hoping that we could start off today, Ellen, by by just telling us about your story about how you got into farming. And because I think the story about your involvement with Potomac Vegetable Farms is is really interesting and not one that we commonly run into. Good. All right. So the beginning of the story, I'm going to go before age 16, is that, uh, as I describe it, I was born speaking plant. I've always had a thing about plants, even when I was really, really little, like those were my pets, were my indoor plants in my house. And I grew up in the suburbs and my mother nurtured this plant affinity by getting me a community garden plot at age 10. So that <laughs> that's when I first started growing my vegetables. And uh, it didn't go particularly well, but I was good at trying. And anyway, um, I decided that what I really liked was soil, plants, and being outside. And so that seemed like maybe I should try working on a farm. And so I started working on uh, Potomac Vegetable Farms when I was 16 years old. And it was uh, a 10 minute commute from my hometown. And I actually had to beg them to hire me because they didn't really want stray 16 year olds from down the street. They wanted college kids with skills. Anyway, they let me yes. they let me work. And uh, that was the beginning of my farming career. And I, I worked for two summers in a row, high school and college. And then uh, after that seemed like it was really starting to take like this was feeling good. I really like this. And so I actually uh, transferred out of the University of Virginia and went to Virginia Tech so I could get a horticulture degree. I figured if I didn't grow up on a farm, I needed everything I could get. And so and I still wanted to get a college degree. So I ended up getting a horticulture degree and ended up at the farm for four different seasons, uh, four summers. And that cemented my relationship with farming. And and so you um, so you got the degree in horticulture. You you got your experience on the farm and then things took kind of an interesting turn at that point. Right. Right. So now comes the part where everybody needs to go away before they can come back. So I had to go away to California and have a boyfriend and do all these other things. And I still stayed involved in agriculture and I actually worked in the seed business. I worked for Harris Moran Seed Company in Davis, California at their research farm. So that was my first touch of uh, agribusiness because I worked on processing tomatoes, which is definitely uh, not a market garden crop. Um, And then I finally came back to Virginia a few years later, and I couldn't figure out how I was ever going to get to have a farm. 
and it was starting to bum me out. And I was starting to think, oh my gosh, maybe I have to go back to school and become an accountant because I'm never going to realize my farm dream. So I came back and visited Potomac Vegetable Farms, which I'd been gone four or five years. And I told my sob story to Hana about how nobody's going to die and give me a farm and nobody's going to die and give me any money so I can buy a farm. And there's, uh, and I just can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. And she said, well, we have all that property out in Loudoun County. Why don't you go out and farm it for us? And so that was the beginning. This was 1992, the beginning of my now grown-up relationship with Potomac Vegetable Farms. And that's how I got hired as a full-time manager and really with a, with a whole property that was open and ready to be developed, a whole nother farm to start. And so you kind of got your, you kind of got your own farm in a way yes. that was, I mean, tied in from a marketing standpoint, but Ab- they basically threw you out there and said, go make this happen, Ellen. Absolutely. So it was, it was really just the right amount of fly by the seat of your pants and have a really great safety net. Right. Because as you say, the market was already there. They said, if we can sell anything you can grow, go grow some stuff and we'll help you. But uh, but I had a lot of autonomy and responsibility to figure out how to do it. And man, we were starting from, you know, two really horrible tractors and one disc. That was my whole list of implements. And now, of course, <laughs> you know, 20 something years later, we have a lot of better equipment. <laughs> to work yeah, with. <laughs> it, sometimes it takes some time to get the things that you need, yes, doesn't it? Yes, it does take time and it certainly takes some money. And so it was wonderful <laughs> to have both the the moral support, the personnel support, and the financial support of an ongoing, successful, mature business behind me. And that made all the difference in the world. Now, I mean, the ongoing, successful, mature business, uh, Hana was the daughter of of Hugh, who had been farming on this land for, I'm thinking like, well, now I think it's something like 50 years, yeah, right? Yeah. It just, and what used to be Tyson's Corner was uh, in, in Virginia was where they, where they got the farm started, right? Yes, that's right. All on rent, Could, all on rented ground. Okay. Okay. And then eventually bought some ground yep. that, that became there. And, and I, I remember because now I was out to see you I guess it was been about a year ago right now. Yep. Um, and, and you were, I mean, when we, when we went to that place, it was very much surrounded by development now, very much an urban agriculture situation. Was that the way it was when you, when you were there? No, it wasn't quite that bad. There were just starting to be the first houses coming right up close to the cow pasture. <laughs> and so okay. it was the beginning of the end, shall we say, of, of suburbia creeping in. And now it's, it's on all sides of the farm. And so they have to hold, tight to keep our boundary against more houses. But that's really given Potomac Vegetable Farms uh, a toehold for a for a farm stand there on the property that's kind of right in suburbia. You're you're further out. You're down you're you're located, I'm thinking 30 miles away? Yep, 35 miles northwest of of the original farm at Tyson's Corner. Yeah. And if, in a truly rural setting. I don't know about truly. I would, I call it the, oh. I call it the exurbs. Okay. That's the modern term for the very, very, very outside edge of suburbia. But there's a lot of big fancy houses, not very far away, but they're not immediately next door yet. They're coming next, okay. next year. <laughs> <laughs> next year. <laughs> next they're going to put them in. Yes. They're so. coming in. And so when, when you got started on the farm 25 years ago, what, what did you, what did you do? How did you, I mean, with, I, I would think that there would be some real challenges to having a, well, with support oftentimes comes expectations, you know, and I mean, you were young. So of course you were, you were probably working like a dog Yes. and, uh, but, but trying to meet those expectations with a limited amount of equipment in a place where you didn't have so many connections because you weren't on ground that you had been on before. Um, what did you, what did that influence the way that you developed the farming systems there? That I think you're at Potomac Potomac Vegetable Farms West, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, really how it worked was a combination of uh, using the knowledge that I had gained through my work at Potomac Vegetable Farms as a much younger person, then uh, and talking to my partners, Hannah and Hugh, and getting their advice. And then what 
was really the breakthrough for me was going to conferences. So I'm a conference junkie from way back, but it was a way for me to plug into the sort of the the brain trust of organic farming in the eastern part of the United States, because I just come from California and sort of touched on the way they farmed out there. And it didn't seem 100 percent applicable to farming in Virginia. So I started going to conferences and that's where I started making connections with other successful growers on the East Coast and getting some really good advice from them about equipment and about process and procedure. You know, what kind of products might I want to use? Uh, what kind of machinery might I want to buy and so forth? And so it was a kind of a, a gentle uh, development of going from those two uh, gasoline tricycle front end row crop oh. tractors to some of of equipment that was really appropriate to a market garden vegetable operation. Those tricycle tractors, I've only ever driven. I mean, I, I've been I've been working in farming now for 25 years, and I've only ever driven one tricycle tractor. And I'll tell you, there was some serious sphincter factor going on with because you can't you can't see the front wheels. You know, it's like you just uh, you, you're kind of going completely on faith. Yep. You know? Yep. And that makes so, sense for another setting, but not for where we wanted to take this business. Well, and you've actually got a fairly hilly farm there. You're not in a you're not on that Central Valley, California no. flat plain where you had be, where you had spent a couple of years yeah. with Harris Moran. No, nope, not at all. It's it's gentle hills, though. It works. It works just fine. Yeah. Yeah. But they're hills. There's definitely Absolutely. there's definitely slope. There's no. So, yeah, there's not a flat place exactly on this farm at all. Now, you mentioned um, the deciding about procedures and products and, and equipment to purchase. Were you, how, how did that relationship work between you and Hannah and Hugh? Was that, were you buying the equipment with your own funds or was that something where you were plowing back in the profits from Potomac Vegetable Farms West into buying that equipment? Right. So at the beginning, there was no real separation between East and West from any kind of financial standpoint. So, and I had no money of my own. And so anything that happened was a group decision. So I would go out into the world and come up with an idea and I'd bring it back to the group and say, Hannah, I think this is what we need. This is what it's going to do. This is what it's going to cost. What do you say? And she'd talk it over and we'd all talk it over and she'd say, yep, let's do it. And so it was the farm investing in, it was the farm business as a whole investing in this new operation out here at this other location. So I had not one cent of my own went into any of this development. It was all the farm business. Yep. And I was on a salary. And uh, so I knew that I was taken care of. I had no direct tie to production. I didn't have to, you know, generate X amount of income for the farm in order to make sure that I got to stay alive. They really provided a generous kind of baseline for me to work from. So I knew I could take care of my everyday needs and then grow the business from there. So you almost found a a situation that was similar to growing up in agriculture and inheriting your parents' farm. Exactly. And, (laughs) and being able to do something new with it. That's really, I mean, that's really, really fortunate. Are you aware of other people who've, who've found similar circumstances? Uh, Surprisingly, no. I haven't come yeah. I I don't have very many examples and the the fastest sort of the cutest way that I describe it is to say when I talk to uh, younger growers or new people who are wannabes out there in the world who are young and don't have any money same as me I say you know you don't have to create the wheel all by yourself you don't have to start a brand new farm from scratch I say go find somebody who's got a farm keep and go work there and don't ever leave and then you get adopted <laughs> It seems to be a method that is not very commonly pursued. And of course, there's a lot of obstacles in the way of why a person wouldn't become adopted and become part of a family business. But uh, I think it's it's a viable avenue and it should be left as an option on the table for anybody who thinks that they want to have a career farming. 
Well, and I think certainly when when people are talking about farm transition strategies, that's a lot of what people are trying to make happen in particularly in dairy and row crop operations now as as older generations are moving out and don't have kids that are interested in taking over is to is to plug in people who are who aren't necessarily family, but who are who are willing to really become part of the operation. And I think that's I mean, it's something that I found um when I was trying to sell my operation was that most people would come and they, they didn't want to buy my farm. They wanted to have their own farm on my farm. Right. And, <laughs> and I, and, and I wonder, I mean, a, a, how did you balance that out? I mean, you were, a obviously a, a, a smart, independent young woman. I mean, I, I imagine you didn't just walk in and go, okay, I'm just going to buy in 100% to the idea that I'm going to become wedded to, to what's happening over there at Potomac Vegetable Farms East. Did you, did you spend, um, did, do you feel like you've imprinted your own personality on, on what you've got, or did you really just kind of graft into what was already going on? No, I think at, by this point, now we're 23 years down the road, my personality has definitely been imprinted on this property, um, as well as a few other key uh, people, including the original owners and Newcombs. But also uh, there was a really important influence um, midway through when um, when I decided to have a kid. So. Uh, there was a, f- a farmer who came and lived on the farm and basically helped me run the place while I was pregnant and then nursing and having an infant. And his name is Heinz Tomet from a farm called Next Step Produce down in Maryland now. And his he had a tremendous influence on the development of this farm. So and you have to remember in the in the story of me being here is that I wasn't hired out of the blue from the ether as someone to come and manage this farm and develop this farm. It, I, it, it happened as we say, organically, right? Or- I grew up. Nice, Ellen. Yeah. That I was grew nice. up through the farm. And so I was a known commodity. We had spent, we'd known each other for years, me and the Newcombs. And so it was a more natural progression than, you know, putting an ad in the paper and saying, I'm looking for a farm manager. Right. Right. You see what I mean? It, it just, it's a very so, different situation. Yeah. So we knew already that we loved each other. Right. We knew that right. we knew that we could speak the same language and understand each other. We knew what mattered to us sort of from an ethical standpoint. We knew we were in alignment in a lot of those core issues. And so uh, that that helped a lot with this smooth transition of bringing in a whole nother personality. Also key point is that both Hannah and Hugh, mother and daughter, uh, are, don't have an ego problem. You know what I'm saying? Like they were allowed, they allowed me to enter into the, the, the business. They didn't have to have everything be their way. You see what I'm saying? Right. And, and that's a crucial point for any existing operation to bring in another personality, you got to give them space to develop. And they did that for me tremendously. Well, and when I was visiting with you last spring, that was something that I, I found remarkable that, that they didn't, they, they didn't seem to have an ego wrapped up right. in things, you know, that this was the, the, it, it certainly wasn't a my way or the highway kind of a situation. And I think so often that is something that breaks down successful farm transitions or even having good relationships between, between a farm owner and maybe bringing on somebody as a farm manager or a field manager is, is that all of that ego gets wrapped up in there. Cause I think that's a lot of what it takes sometimes to be a, to be a, a an organic vegetable farmer in a sea of, of convention. Yeah. You know, it, and, and, and it's really interesting to me that, that Hannah and Hugh don't, they just don't have that. And it, and it was apparent just in the, the short amount of time that I spent with them, that they didn't, they didn't have that tight iron grip right. on things. Right. It's gotta be this way. And I don't even want to talk about it. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I agree. And I've never understood or, or fathomed how much of a difference it makes that all of us are female. And whether, you know what I mean, whether that has what, how much that has to do with this ego situation and our, our basic, each of us, our basic desire to work on a team. None of us likes to do anything all by ourselves. 
we like, I, we really enjoy this idea of being on a team and that together we make, we're more powerful than we are as individuals. And I think that's somehow that plays in. I just don't know how much. Is that something that's played out in terms of your, uh, your employee management as well? Yes. And it, I mean, it has everything to do with the style in which we farm, right. And the kind of farming we do, this is, as you know, uh, the most intensive labor intensive kind of farming there is, is this kind of vegetable growing and this kind of marketing, all the marketing we do is all direct retail marketing. And so we just, we need people everywhere all the time to do lots of things. And, but that's what works for us because we like working with people and we like being on a big team. And so, yeah, that, that's, that's who we are. We like people. (laughs) Well, and I think, and, and I don't, I wasn't there during the growing season, so I don't know a whole lot in person about how your systems are set up there. But, but if you could describe those from what I've seen of pictures and you and I have talked about it, it seems like you have a, a production system that is very much oriented around, uh, high labor, um, and, and teamwork. Yes. Yeah, we have, we, we use high labor, but we also, and I don't want people to get the idea that that means we do every single thing by hand. I, I think we have a kind of an, well, of course I think this, a wonderful and perfect balance between equipment, you know, being well capitalized and having some really nice, fairly specialized equipment and having still to do lots of things with people all the time. And so I, it's for us, it's a really nice balance. So tell us about your production system there at, at Potomac Vegetable Farms. Well, um, here's here's a couple of key features. One is, um, just so everybody knows what kind of terms we're going to be using, we farm using organic practices. We are not certified organic. So that's baseline understanding. Okay. Okay. Um, and we are about in year five or six of a really t- uh, rigid, fairly or aggressive rotation where out of all the property farm that land that we're farming here, half of it is in soil building and half of it is, is in cash crops at any one moment. That's wow. That's pretty yeah. generous rotation, shall we say? Yeah. Yes. So, um, uh, and so our, our system of how are we going to grow really good vegetables, a lot of them that taste good and are good, is that we use compost that we make ourselves. We have this generous rotation of one year on, one year off. Uh, we're using some imported minerals of things that we need, phosphorus, boron, etc., and a little bit of liquid fertility and this tremendous cover cropping and green manure system. So those are all the different ways that we're trying to improve the soil and make everything go easier and better every year, better than the last. So that's kind of the soil management uh, aspect of how we farm. Um, but we're quite highly capitalized. We, I love equipment. I love equipment. I have eight tractors. Um, we use a spading machine to do all our tillage. We use a harrow. We use, uh, we grow many of our crops on, on plastic and we're big users of mulch, both the plastic mulch and also hay mulch. And that's an expensive and labor intensive process that we are just resolutely committed to. We just love mulch. <laughs> well, and I forget who I, who I talked to recently who said, you know, that, that, the the quickest way to buy your neighbor's farm is to buy their hay crop. Yeah. You know, that's because exactly right. that just, you know, so, I mean, you really, you're, you're buying in, that's a lot of fertility that you're importing every time you're putting on that, that la- thick layer of mulch. Yep. And so for us, the, the, that mulch system com- either combined with the plastic or just by itself mulching is, um, again, it's a fertility input. It's a weed control strategy. It's a temperature control strategy. It's a water mitigation strategy, right? Now we're all, now all we hear about is California not having any water. 
wow, organic mulch really conserves water, uh, even on the pathways. Um, so it's an important part of how we farm. So we do all, all, I would say in terms of cropping, we grow everything except sweet corn. That's the only crop we don't grow. And we're not really uh, traditional fruit growers. We don't grow any strawberries or melons. So uh, from A to Z, except for corn, that's about okay. right. Yeah. Okay. And, and so, um, so direct seeded crops, transplanted crops, yep. those are all part of your, yep. cause you guys have a CSA and, and then you go to farmer's markets in, in DC, yep. right. Yep. And then, and then you're also doing the, uh, you've also got the farm stand that you're supporting right. at the, at the East farm. We also have a farm stand here. So we have two. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so you've, you've kind of got your, wow, that's a management handful. Yes, it is. Then. <laughs> Well, yes, it is. Now, are you one of those farm stands that's able to buy in from other people and sell, or are you only selling stuff that's grown at Potomac Vegetable Farms? No, we buy in. Um, for us, we feel like we have to have a few sort of what we call sexy items in order to get people to actually turn off the road. So we got to have sweet corn. You got to have peaches. You got to have some kind of cantaloupes or watermelons and, and, and apples. So those are, we buy in all of that stuff. We also carry some local meats. So we try to make it, you know, appealing. It's, it's a tough competition when whole foods is not that far away to have people make a special trip to, to buy local food. And so we, we want to have uh, a diverse offering to get those people to come and to come back the second time. So yeah, okay. at a roadside stand, we can have buy and sell anything we want. Okay. And is that something that you're managing yourself, Ellen, or do you have somebody else in charge of that? No, that's what I manage that. And I usually will, hopefully we'll choose one person out of the team who will kind of take many of the responsibilities off my plate uh, once the seasons gets going, but it's, yeah, it's still always on the list. Wow. That's, I mean, that's a, yeah. Talk about a diversification strategy. That's a, uh, that's a serious diversification strategy. Yeah. It's an there. interesting topic. This, the roadside stand topic and lots of growers don't have a stand. And so it's not interesting to a lot of people, but for us, it's um, it's economically not that advantageous. We have not been wickedly successful at making money standing on the side of the road, selling things, but for us, it's kind of a social mission aspect. We feel that it's important to be feeding our closest neighbors. And so even though we're not making really very good money at all on the corner, uh, it's keeping us, uh, it's building social capital. It's keeping people who drive by uh, friendly towards that little farm that they pass, you know, two, three, four, five, six times a day, whether they pull in or not, they know that right. we're here and hopefully they think good thoughts about it. And so we persist in selling on the side of the road, even though the economics are eh, break even at best. Interesting. Isn't that That's funny? really, <laughs> that is kind of funny. And I would think, especially for somebody like you, who's so focused on the, that cost of production and, and the cost of marketing through different avenues. Cause I know that's, I mean, that's a project that you're working yes. on with Southern Sog right now. Yes. Um, uh, that that's a, that's yeah. It's a, it's surprising that you would make that choice yes. to me. Well, we've, okay. uh, and then the, the, if you want to go a little bit further, we've actually cashed in on the social capital uh, where we had a land use battle for the property immediately across the road from us where the county wanted to build three schools, uh, elementary, middle and high school right next to the farm. And we pitched a fit and got a lot of local people to stand with us and say, that's not an appropriate use for this beautiful agricultural area. And we don't want you to impact Potomac vegetable farms. And so, okay. Yeah. And we won. So the, 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 it didn't happen. So it, it's, it's, how do you put a number value on that? I don't know, but it was an important lesson, I think for us. Well, and you and I both know the numbers can't tell anything. And I think it is, it's, I think it's something we oftentimes forget about. You know, we talk about things like social capital, but it is. I mean, that's what capital's for, right? It's meant to be at some point you have to do something useful yes. with it. Yes. You know, and if, if you, you know, and sometimes it is you're, you're holding it in reserve until that time when there's something useful to be done. But 
it is you need to be thinking about how 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 can we use this right. in different situations. Right. So. Good. Ellen, I'm going to break in here for a word from our sponsors. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by Vermont Compost. Carl Hammer, the founder and owner of the company, likes to describe potting soil as a set of promises, a promise that it has the nutrients the plant needs, that it has the microbes the plant needs to help forage those nutrients, and that it's free of weed seeds. I used Vermont Compost Fort V as a blocking mix and potting soil for over 12 years on my farm, and we grew great transplants with it. I mean really great transplants year after year in soil blocks and in traditional cell flats. We even grew potted perennial rosemary plants in it, a real testament to the structure of the soil which can keep the microbes alive over an extended period of time and still provide good aeration for the roots. We're talking years that these plants were in these containers. When you put plants in containers, whether it's a five-year-old rosemary in a 20-gallon nursery can or a 24-day-old lettuce seedling in a 10-20 cell tray, you need an optimized matrix of materials that can provide a healthy plant within a restricted media volume. Vermont compost potting soils provide just that consistently year after year. VermontCompost.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is also sponsored by Audible, where you can get a free audiobook when you sign up for a 30 day trial at audibletrial.com slash farmer to farmer. I do this podcast, so I clearly think there's power in the spoken word, especially because of the ability to get something else done while you're absorbing the content, whether it's a book on managing employees, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, or a romance novel. I love listening when I'm on the road, and I spent years of tractor time plugged into selections from Audible when I didn't always have the time to read. And it's so easy now that you can probably you're probably carrying an iDevice or an Android with you just about everywhere. And you can even get these cool earbuds that plug out the they, they cancel out the noise, but they still let you listen to your MP3 player. So you're protecting your ears and getting entertained at the same time. And Audible has over 100,000 titles that you can choose from. Just go to audibletrial.com slash farmer to farmer to get your free audiobook download. So um, I, I'd like to tack back and talk to you, talk about the uh, the the mulching program on the farm, okay. because I mean, I I mean, you're farming. Remind me how many acres of vegetables. So this is we have about 20 acres tilled. And so 10 would be vegetables. 10 would be soil building because that's a I mean, it's doing mulch on any significant level is is pretty darn difficult. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to do efficiently. It's hard to find clean mulch. So can you tell me how you, how you're making that work in your system? Well, we, uh, once upon a time, we used to make all our own mulch, which was really crazy. Uh, we grew, we would grow rye and, and cut and bale it ourselves. And eventually I decided that was too much trouble for me to be able to manage both being the vegetable grower and being a mulch grower. And so we out started outsourcing the, the mulch itself. And so we've, we've have a tremendous relationship with a farm that's just um, about seven miles away from here that grows hay for animals, but we buy their sort of second quality, right? We don't need the most expensive horse hay. We just need carbon, you know, right. Right. And so, and so they love having us as a customer because they have second quality hay all the time and we're, and we take it in big amounts and we do it every year, year after year. And so we have a really good relationship with that farm. And so whenever we're ready, we call them up, they bring a whole hay wagon full of bales, park it, we take it to the field, unload it, and we still are using square bales. We don't use, okay. yeah, we don't use round bales. We go for the most labor intensive of all, <laughs> which is. <laughs> and, and you're laying those out by hand. Yeah, we lay them out by hand. We cut the strings and we spread them by hand, every bale. And people think we're a little bit crazy. Um, I think you're a little bit crazy. Yeah, yeah but I, for us, what the way this works from a labor standpoint is we know we need a lot of people to be here during the heaviest of the harvest seasons, right? So we're talking from mid-August, August, September, October, when the bulk of the crops come in, we need to have a lot of hands on deck. Well, but those people are available in April, May, and June. And this is a really good work for that many people to be doing. So for us, from a labor management perspective, it really makes sense to go ahead and have some jobs that have to be done without machinery. 
And so if, if, if it was all with round bales and it had to involve tractor drivers and uh, you know what I mean? A higher sort of a higher yeah. skill level, then what would all these other people be doing? Plus I don't think, I don't think the mulching is done very well when you use round bales. It's not as it's, thick as it should be. It's really variable. Uh, I don't know. I don't like it. So we, we, we really enjoy this process. It's a big, hard, sweaty, expensive job. And man, is it nice when you're done. I mean, that field is just <laughs> beautiful and you just walk away and you don't have to come back until it's time to, to harvest. And that that's wonderful. And so when you're, when you're mulching between, between plastic, you're obviously just covering the wheel tracks and, and yep. any space outside of the bed. Yep. When you're, when you're mulching your, your plants that aren't on plastic, how are you, is that something where you're putting the plants in and then mulching around them? Yeah. At this point, there's, there really isn't any uh, crop that we mulch uh, straw right or hay right up to the plant itself. The only, okay. the only crop would be garlic where we mulch okay. the whole field. You know, a third of an acre is just 100% covered with hay. Everything else, right. if we're going to do any kind of mulch, it's going to be an aisle situation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and I think that's, I think it's always interesting with garlic, you know, the, the mulch or not mulch question is, is really, I mean, even up here, you can get away without mulching garlic and still get, get good overwintering. Uh -huh. um, and you guys, what are, if we were talking zones, what, what zone are you in? We would be six B seven A. Okay. Something like okay. that. Yeah. And we would be, we're somewhere four B five A, something like that here in, in Northeast Iowa. So, um, but it, but it really is, I think where it really makes the difference is not just on survivability from a temperature standpoint, but that whole freeze thaw cycle that I think is so unpredictable in your area. Absolutely. So we, we like it for, well, it's just exactly as I say, it's a big, hard, sweaty job. You do it. And then we don't have to do anything to that garlic crop until it's time to harvest. That's, you know, right. five, six months of nothing. That's, that's good. <laughs> you know, that is good. there's no weeds, none that come up through that mulch. And you're getting the same thing that in, in your, in your fields where you're using it between the plastic. Exactly. If you do a yeah. good job, you should, you just walk away until it's time to, to come in and harvest the crop. You said, if you do a good job, help me define a good job. Uh, Cause you know, yeah. I, I'm really big on defining expectations. So I, how do you, how do you explain to your crew what a good job of mulching looks like. Yeah, a good job. Well, what I want, what I try to, what I say is you have to make sure that the sun cannot touch the soil. The job of the mulch okay. is to get 100% in the way of the sun ever touching the soil and germinating a weed. And so put, you have to put on as much as, as needed to make sure that's going to happen and stay that way for a few months. So that's what a good job is. A bad job, I mean, bad mulch job is the worst of all possible worlds, right? Because now you can't cultivate. Right. And so with the track, right, yeah, you're screwed possible. if you don't do it right. And so I talk through all of the ramifications of a poor job and uh, and they're pretty good at getting it right. OK, OK. Now, you also you said that the part of what you're doing now for soil building and I also assume for weed control is this is this one year of cover crops, one year of of vegetables rotation. Did did I understand you correctly that that's something you've only been doing for five or six years? Yes. Yeah. And I mean, so you went, did you go from having 20 acres of vegetables down to having 10? No, we just, ex we've just been oh. expanding the fields. And then once we got this rotation in mind, uh, it gave us the, we could go ahead and use more of our ground because we weren't going to grow more vegetables, but we knew that we really liked this rotation. And so, yeah. And, and the, it's important to give credit on this rotation to the Nordells. This comes from the Nordells who are farmers from Pennsylvania that farm with right. horses. I can't remember the name of their farm, but they've written up this system, this idea of cover cropping. They call weed the soil, not the crop. Right. And so right. they developed this this strategy really as a weed control strategy of this this uh, cover crop clock, they call it. And it's when I heard them speak at a conference. Here we are saying how much yes. conferences are important to me. It I finally, you know, I'd heard about them and I'd heard about what they'd said and it just never clicked. And all of a sudden I'm sitting there and it's like, 
oh my gosh, they've absolutely got it. I get it. This is it. I got to do it. You know how that happens? Like I just wasn't I, ready to hear it. And then I was. And then suddenly, yeah, that one thing yes. happens and sort of the veil drops. Yes. And so yeah. that was it. I was just totally committed from that point. Okay. So I'm going to say right here, we'll, we'll make sure that in the show notes, there's a reference to the weed, the soil, not the crop. We'll find either an article yep. or a book or something. We'll make sure there's something available for the listeners there. Yep. But um, Ellen, why don't you tell us about how you've implemented that on, how does this work at a practical level on your farm? Um, well, from the original, when you final, when you decide that this is what you're going to do, and split your farm in half, of course, you want to try to get a different kinds of fields in each half of the, of the rotation, right? Cause you need to have some early ground, you need to have some good ground and you need to have some bad ground in each of those halves. Does that make sense? Right. Cause yes, it does. you know, there's certain places on your farm that are always going to be the first ones to dry out on March 17th or April 3rd or whatever it is. And you got to make sure that no matter which year it is, you have a little bit of that ground on, on, you know, the, the cropping year or the cover cropping year. So then once you have your list of all your areas that are available for vegetable crops for this season, then we just use the other normal uh, parameters to decide what the rotation is going to be, which is we don't want to grow the same family after itself for at least three years. So for us, the, the biggest plant family is the solanaceous family. Brassica is coming in close second now. And so we'll, we look at that list of places and say, okay, where can we grow tomatoes? That's the most important thing. Tomatoes, right. peppers, eggplant, potatoes. Where can the solanaceous crops go? And then, and then we work our way down to the little crops like okra, Right. Uh, I don't think I don't think we would. <laughs> all, all three plants of <laughs> yes. okra. Yeah, we would never have a problem finding a place to plant okra because we plant so little of it. It can go anywhere. And so that's how we develop the rotation. OK, OK. So I'm going to I'm going to take a sidebar here and talk about okra. Right. Because yeah. you guys are actually growing that commercially. I mean, you guys, I assume, are picking it when it's when it's nice and small. Yeah. OK, because I think that's something that a lot of people up here don't understand about okra. Is that, you know, okra is supposed to be picked at, I mean, That's two to max. three to yeah. four inches yeah. max. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, and a lot of times up here, people are picking it when it's six and eight inches long and it's big and seedy and nasty. And it really is. It's one of these, it needs to be picked like a baby crop. Yeah. It's a delicacy. Right? Yep. So veering back now, I wanted to get that little bit in about the, about the okra, good, some good actionable information. Uh, people can take that to the bank this summer, but if you're so, so after you plant tomatoes, um, now the tomatoes come out in the fall, what happens next in this, in this rotation? Okay. So next you want to put in your winter cover crop, which for us is usually wheat or barley combined with either uh, vetch or crimson clover. And then that's going to grow all winter. And you're going to let that grow almost to maturity. We've, we've started doing this. So the following year, we're going to let it go brown and set seed. Really? Yeah, it's pretty exciting. And then we come in. So that may be, you know, June or so. You may not let it get all the way to straw stage, but, you know, we're definitely letting it get into into the brown stage. Very carbon. Yeah, we're going for carbon. Yeah. So that's part of the soil building program is to grow crops and let them get carbonaceous. So then we'll come in, flail mow, uh, probably spread some compost and then we'll spade that in. So this is the long, long standing cover crop. Then we'll come back in after two or three weeks when that's kind of started to melt down. We'll come in and seed um, some kind of a summer uh, green manure mix. So probably millet or Sudan grass combined with some buckwheat and some cowpeas. So that'll be our three species mix for the summer. And then we'll usually uh bush hog that at least once while it's growing you get really a lot of benefit from those grasses just like as if they were being grazed by animals we're going to graze it with the bush hog you get all this tremendous right. sloughing off of those roots and then a regrowth and a new set of of roots growing underneath and we want that right 
Because when you mow, then the the root the the plant has to balance the amount of roots that are under the ground back to match what's on top because yep. it doesn't have enough energy to support that big root root mass yep. underneath. And so we want to encourage that flush, and then uh, sometime in maybe August September, we'll flail mow that, spade it in. And then we'll plant the same cover crop again for the winter. And then the next year we go back into vegetables. So if, if the crop, the cover crop is, is preceding a cash crop, we won't let it go brown. Of course, we're going to put it in when it's beautiful, lush and green at the, the, the traditional time at 10% uh, flower. Right. So that we get right. that, that fast nutrient cycling and not this long, slow carbon breakdown. Yeah. And actually, I know Gary Zimmer talks about um, doing even even greener cover crops to plow in, you know, for the spring. He talks about doing this if you're if you've got a, a regular convent, a corn farm, you know, where you're just doing uh, field corn to go in and plant oats first thing in the spring at, at a really heavy rate. Let it come up. And then when you're ready to plant the corn that you turn in the oats and basically that you got this huge flush of nutrients being released so that you're actually doing it like a starter fertilizer. Yep at that point. Yep. I think that sounds smart. Are you also using then if you're coming in with an early crop in the spring, are you using a winter killed uh, cover crop? We've been playing with that some, and I would have to say the jury is still out. We have not figured it out exactly how to work with these, with the radishes and the oats. Um, They make a beautiful crop in the fall. For instance, this year, they had a beautiful crop in the fall, but they winter killed so early I think because we had such a cold winter that I'm a little disappointed at how little residue there is in the spring and how there's really nothing going on out there. And it concerns me. So I want to be I want to be really careful this fall to only put that winter kill stuff only on the one piece of ground I really need first. Okay. because I think I just didn't have enough live plants there over the winter. And that makes me nervous. (laughs) <laughs> and and you've got a relatively, I, I think, compared again to my area, you've got a you have a relatively long spring. When do you guys usually expect to get into the field for the first time there in, in Virginia? The first week in April. And that would okay. that would be, you know, the perf. there'd be one spot, one spot you're going to be able to get in. Oh, really? Yeah. OK. Yeah. OK. So spring actually moves pretty quickly for you. Yeah. Then. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Interesting. That's really interesting. So, um, and again, this is because you're, because you're actually using these cover crops as a, as part of a, letting them go all the way to maturity. Cause you're not trying to get them out before you're, pl- before you have to plant the tomatoes or the peas or whatever, you let them go all the way to maturity. You're actually building soil instead of just cycling nutrients with it, but you're still adding compost on top of that. Yep. We want to put yeah. compost on every piece of ground every year and we're not using, using a huge quantity. It's, it's somewhere between five and 10 tons to the acre, which is something, but it's not huge. It's not huge. In fact, I mean, if I, when, when I've done the math on that, it doesn't end up being, it's, it's not like a garden layer of compost or you got an inch or two. It's, it's a smattering on top of the soil. It's a sprinkling. Yep. You can see it, but it's, it doesn't, you couldn't measure it exactly as you say with a ruler. It doesn't, it doesn't come up to the top of the first mark. Yeah. Right. And there, and there's still, and there's still sunshine hitting the soil in spots. It's not like you've got a complete layer across, across the top of it. Exactly. Now you said you make your own compost. Yes. This w- and do you make do you make all of your own compost? Are you also buying stuff no, in? No, no, no. We make all our own compost. So this is this was a big a watershed decision that we made as a business long time ago now, almost 20 years ago. And again, it came through this this my my preferred educational process, which is going to conferences, hearing growers speak. Um, I got excited about making compost. And I ended up taking a a four day class on composting from the Lubkeys of Austria who came to the United States. This was way back in 1994, 1995. And again, it was one of those things where I came back to my partners, Hannah and Hugh, and I said, all right, ladies, I think this is what we need to be doing to be on the forefront of agriculture. And I think this is what we should be doing here. This is what it's going to cost. Here's what the benefits are going to be. What do you say? And they said, 
let's do it. And so wow. it's a big, it's a, it's a big deal to decide to make really good compost with the right equipment in the right place. So it was an investment well, in equipment and in a site on the farm. Right. Cause it, you have to, it, it takes land and it takes machinery to do it at any kind of a scale. Right. So the yeah. scale that we're doing is we make maybe two to 300 tons a year, which is, you know, more than you'd ever want to do by hand. It's more than you'd want to do with a, you know, with a, a loader and a manure spreader. Um, so this is, this is farm scale composting, but it's done really, really well with a turning, with a compost turning machine. So it's a windrow style composting. One of those that you pull with the tractor, yes. but it, it bridges over the top of the the windrow yes. and make sure that you got that that completely thorough, uh, thorough mixing that you need to get good compost. Yeah. So it's about it's about mixing at the beginning when you're making your pile to make sure you have a homogeneous materials. But then once the composting starts, the real point of that turner is to lift the compost and release all the carbon dioxide that the microbes have created through their breathing and then let right. oxygen then come back into the pile as, as it drops back down into that perfect uh, V shape. So making sure that it stays aerobic yep. rather than turning anaerobic. Yep. On yep. You. So it's, it's, okay. yeah, it's making sure your critters can breathe. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's the livestock on that's your my farm livestock. right there. Yep. That's my livestock. <laughs> Now, uh, making 30 to, or 200 to 300 fin tons of finished compost a year. I mean, this is, this is no small undertaking, uh, from a, from a material sourcing standpoint, where are you getting all of that manure? Yeah. So we, uh, we've gotten, we've had different sources over the years. And at this moment, we're sourcing dairy manure from the closest dairy we can get which is 20 miles away. So that's, this is, this is when being in the suburbs or the exurbs is a downside is, right. is sourcing materials like this. There's one dairy anywhere near us. And luckily they're open to selling manure and they will truck it for us. I used to do all my own trucking with a dump truck and I'm happy to outsource that as well at this point. So yeah, we buy dairy manure and then uh, hay, uh, round bales of hay and that's easy to find and then um i get a bunch a bunch a bunch of leaves from a local my closest uh sit small city which is leesburg the town of leesburg and okay yeah they need to get rid of the leaves that they pick up off the street and they are happy to bring them to me because i don't charge a tipping fee so those are my three major ingredients is hay leaves and manure Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so the, the hay, the, the leaves are probably helping. I mean, that's a good source of carbon and also providing some, some lift and some, um, yes. some volume to yes. the mix. Yes. There. I love working you know, with leaves. Yeah. I did leaf composting out in a farm that I managed out in Maine and, and it was, we made some fantastic compost, even just with straight leaf mold yeah. and, and a few vegetable trimmings added in. But we did kind of that same thing where we were getting those, the leaves from the city and boy, did it make a, it, it was great. It was just such a great resource. Yep. And especially if you're running a farm in a place where there aren't a whole lot of vegetable farms, it's not like you've got people clamoring to get a hold of those leaves. Right. So you they know, were, yeah, so. it's a good relationship. They're happy that we want it and uh, we're really happy they'll bring it to us for free. So with the, uh, with the lube key method for composting, what is it that makes that, I mean, what, what is it that makes it different than just putting a bunch of stuff in a pile and running through with the turner every now and then? Yeah. Well, uh, one of the key elements is I, I gave you my three major ingredients, but the other two ingredients are some finished compost from another pile and some soil. And this is, we actually want clay the clay part of the soil. So it doesn't have to, it's not like we're, we're inoculating with your best topsoil. We want actually the physical properties of clay itself. So you can use subsoil is perfect. So any kind okay. any kind of fill that I can get bright, red, beautiful Virginia clay is perfect in this case. So that's <laughs> fairly unusual in composting and the lube keys are very, they're big on making sure you use some clay in the pile. So that's one distinguishing feature. And then what the most important thing is to 
that I'm thinking about those microbes as actual livestock, as if it mattered whether they lived or died. And so I have to make sure they can keep breathing. So I can't be willy nilly uh, deciding when to turn the compost when it suits me. I have to turn the compost when the microbes need air. And so we go out and measure both the temperature, but we also are measuring the carbon dioxide on the piles every day to find out whether the microbes have breathed up all the oxygen. And that's when it's time to turn the pile. So it's very um, intentional. There's no, oh, whatever about it. We go out and we say, hello, are you breathing? And do you need some oxygen? And they'll say, yes, we used it all up. Please turn the pile. <laughs> and that's, so that's a <laughs> fairly different than, yeah, we got a bunch of stuff in the back that's just sitting in a pile. And, and one other piece that's important for people to remember um, that are making compost is we make it all at once. We, we cr- construct the pile and we make sure we're, we've got a good mix, the good carbon to nitrogen ratio, and then we don't add anything more, right? You can't keep right. adding new ingredients and ever be finished. So we make a good pile and then we take care of that pile until it's done. And then you're stockpiling more ingredients in another location until you're ready to make the new pile. Exactly. Introduce the, I mean, so you might have like a a pile of, of moldy, smelly vegetables somewhere on the farm, Yes. but that's like, that's pre-compost. That's just moldy, smelly vegetables. Right. And then we'll, we'll go up and use that when it's, when we're actually constructing the pile, you have about a week window through which you can keep adding new materials to the pile. And then you have to just stop. And now we have to let the process go and you can't add any new ingredients. And so, so this is a a lot of work, a lot of time and effort and, but we get really, really good compost and we get it fast. So our process is that we'll have finished compost in eight to 10 weeks. That's pretty quick. Okay. Yeah. And how many how many batches of compost are you making over the summer? Is this just a you do this once a year or do you have multiple piles, multiple, multiple piles. batches of compost yeah. going throughout the season? Yeah, multiple batches. So, so maybe four or five times we'll make two piles at the same time and and carry that through and then maybe five weeks later we'll do it again. So so that you don't want to be turning piles for all day long. You know, you just turn it a little bit, you know, so you have a little bit of work over the course of the season instead of all concentrated at once. But it really is its own enterprise. I mean, you've, like you said, you have, yes. you've got, uh, you've got a turner. You probably have to have a tractor with a creeper gear to, to run that turner. Yes. Um, and I'm assuming a fairly large piece of equipment to turn, to run that turner as well. No, it doesn't require uh, a lot of power. It's just a, it doesn't. Just a okay. 65 horse is, is enough. Uh, the, the other piece of equipment that is how are you going to build the piles? And uh, we use a skid loader or a bobcat is what people like to say. That's what, right. and that's a ex- wonderful, expensive piece of equipment to have. So, but you've really invested a lot, not just in terms of capital, but also in terms of, 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 um, management effort right. into this, into this compost pile, right. into this building process. Right. And now the, the last exciting part for us for composting, like I said, we've been doing this for almost 20 years now, is now we're starting to add some other interesting ingredients into the pile. So for instance, um, our uh, many of our soils here in Virginia are low in phosphorus. And so instead of putting rock phosphate straight out into the field, Tennessee brown rock, we're putting it into the compost we're adding rock phosphate to the compost pile and letting it go through the composting process, which means it's going to become much more available. All of those microbes yes. are kind of, they're, they're chewing on the outside of the, of the, on the outside of those pieces of phosphorus yes. and, and enlivening and really it, I would say. Enlivening it. I yeah. like that. I like That's that. That's a nice word. And so, so then we, so we've been doing that for a while. Then we started using some azomite in the pile. And that's another mined material out of the Western part of the country that has trace amounts of 
of uh, elements that I can't even remember what their names are, but I'm sure right. I need them. And then well, uh, isn't isn't it short for like the A to Z yes. of minerals, including trace elements? I think that's what azomite stands for. Yes. So it's a little so. bit of everything. And then this year, I think I want to use kelp. I want to buy um, a bulk you know, bulk kelp and start putting that in the pile. So this is, this is when it gets fun is when you can start playing around with these kinds of things on your own place. And of course, this was something that you, you didn't do when you were starting out. This is, this is, I I mean, even like you're talking about these, just starting to add these extras in late in the process. This wasn't when you were first learning how to build compost. This is really that this is that extra one to 5% that, uh, on top now that you've kind of got the rest of the process mastered. Absolutely. That's what I call, um, we got the cake and now we're ready for icing, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the icing doesn't do you any good unless you've got good cake Absolutely. underneath. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, unless you're five and then <laughs> who cares you just want the cake? icing. <laughs> then who cares about the cake? Give me some icing. So I think it's, I think it's really interesting, Ellen, that you are, uh, you majored in horticulture. I, I also got a degree in horticulture. Um, the, the, that that's, that's where your major was, but you've really turned out to be very, very focused on the soils rather than on, I mean, I'm sh- obviously you're focused on the plants. Um, I mean, that's, that's what you're making your money on, but you've really, I, it seems like you've put a lot of time and energy into, into the, 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 the foundation for those plants into that soil as a, especially as a living fraction and as a, as a, as an organism yes. in and of itself. Yes. Yeah. I would agree. That's the thing we spend really the most time and energy on is, is managing biology on the, from a soil standpoint. And then it's really just been in the last few years where I've gotten sm- even smarter, I hope, where I'm addressing some of these chemistry needs of the soil. So we've gotten more interested in making sure that there's no missing elements in the soil chemistry. And so that's why we've started to add the rock phosphate. That's why we started to use some dry blended fertilizers to bring in some elements that are just, we just don't have enough of on the farm. So that growing cover crops on property is not going to create elements that aren't there. See what I'm saying? If there's no boron in the parent material, you're not going to get it unless you go somewhere and get it and put it on top. Right. And so it took right. me a long time to figure that out, even though that sounds really simple. <laughs> I didn't believe well, it for the for a while. And now I feel like I have a, a, a nicer balance of dealing with this chemistry aspect as well as the biology part. I think it's I mean, I think it is one of the challenges of the of being a, an organic or, a, you know, um, a using organic practices kind of a grower is that you not only have to master and understand what the chemical farmers have to understand, which is that you, you have in that situation, you're putting on everything that the plant needs. I mean, it's almost, you know, it's like the hydroponic guys, right? right? They know, they know that there's no boron there unless they put it in there. But then as a, as a biological farmer, you also have to, you, you're kind of steeped in the religion of, of freeing up the nutrients that are already available in the soil and counting on the biology to take care of that. But, but you do kind of have to blend that with this other, with this other element. Yes. That's, that's a little less, a a little less sexy, a little less, um, um, you know, earth goddessy, if you will. Exactly. Have you seen a result then? I mean, I, I think it's really easy to kind of go, well, I, you know, I went to a lecture by Gary Zimmer or I, I went to, you know, I've, I've been sitting in on these soil fertility talks and now I've got, um, I, I know that I need to balance my soil as you've been adding in those extra nutrients that you weren't dealing with before. Have you noticed a difference in your, in your yields, in the quality of the produce that you're kicking out? Yes. We've seen across the board, um, better yields of better quality product. That's just as, as simple as I can say it. We're just getting better at this all the time. Things are easier. You know what I'm saying? Every process along the way is easier. The tillage is easier. The planting is easier. The weeding is easier. And then we are, we're getting really nice quantities of product off our patches. So we actually don't have to farm as much land to get the same amount of product. And so that 
it played in nicely with this realization that we could do this, the crop rotation of taking half the fields out. See what I'm saying? Right. 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 So even though it seems like we're farming less, we're still getting the same or more produce off this, off the set amount of acreage because everything is going right. So it's hard. Yeah. You say you've got something to say. Well, I I was just going to say, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a corollary to when we talk about vegetable farming, it almost doesn't make any sense to talk about the number of acres that you're farming. What really makes sense to talk about is how many dollars are you getting off of those acres? Cause that's actually a much more, uh, much more reflects what's happening in terms of the scale of your operation. Absolutely. And of course it's what really matters, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty cool to say, Oh, I got, I farm 25 acres of vegetables in the Hills of Northeast Iowa. But you know, did you, what did that result in? Because if you're farming 25 acres of vegetables on 60 inch centers, you're not going to get very much product. Right. You know, if you're more densely planting, if you've got the nutrients to, to, and the, and the soil biology to support the yields, you're in a completely different world right. at that point right. that I think is much more relative when we, but of course we don't tend to like to talk about money. You know, that's, that's a little bit harder than acres. Except so, for me. I love to talk about money. I know you love to. <laughs> so, so talk to me about talking about money. How did you, I mean, this is a big, a big effort that you're making right now. How did you get into the world of talking about money? Well, I just can't help it. I, I, you know, I come, the, the folks that I work with, the Newcombs and some of the other growers in our neighborhood have always been interested in transparency, which is now a word we use a lot in politics and so forth. They've always said to people, this is how much money we make and this is how we do it as a way of helping new growers have a reality check. And so it was sort of the culture that I grew up in. And then it just became somehow my mission to help growers learn about and talk more about productivity in terms of dollars, how to make, not just to be a good grower from a horticultural or an agricultural standpoint, but how to make good decisions on the farm that make it so you can stay in business. So that's my thing is I'm, I want people to be successful in their business of being farmers. And of course that means you have to be a You have to have good growing skills and you have to have good soil and you have to have good management of your people. That's it's sort of like the crowning achievement. It brings all together all the aspects of this really cool profession, which is that, yes, we are scientists and we're uh, biologists and we're uh, human resource managers and there's a political aspect. And then, but the business part brings it all together. And if you can succeed as a business, it means that you must be doing a number, all those other things have to be going well also. Right. So if you want to talk numbers with me, I would say that we're grossing somewhere in the $40,000 an acre of produce kind of numbers. So you have to say, well, what does that mean? Well, it means that we're growing a lot of stuff. We're getting we're good at growing things, but we're also in a really rich market. So I understand that if I were in your position in Iowa and my, and the numbers that I could get at market were different, of course it wouldn't be 40, but you can still guarantee we got some yield going on here. Right. You've got good production (laughs) practices to back up those, those high prices. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a pretty nice combination. So Ellen, the, um, so Ellen, if we wanted to find out more information about about your your work around the business of farming, where would we go to do that? So the project that I've been working on with Southern SOG, which is the Southern Sustainable Agriculture Working Group, which is quite a mouthful, is called Growing Farm Profits. And it's a, it's a training session uh, that we've been teaching all around the southern part of the United States. But uh, we're starting to branch out and uh, some of us are going into other parts of the world uh, or the other parts of the country to teach some of these ideas about how to assess what's going on on your farm and figure out which crops you're making money on. So the southern, you could type in Growing Farm Profits Uh, And we're working with uh, the University of Wisconsin using a tool called the Veggie Compass. And there's a website that goes with Veggie Compass. And um, 
if a person wanted to be in touch with me in particular about doing some teaching, I have a website that goes with my name, Ellen Polishuk. So those are all different places where you could find out about this work. And of course, we'll, we'll link to all of those in our show notes. So if you're ho- hopefully you're out driving the tractor or in the greenhouse while you're getting this done, don't stop doing what you're doing. We'll, uh, yeah. we'll make sure it's easy for you to come back to it later Good. here. Good. Okay. Uh, so, uh, this is great, Ellen. So let's, uh, we're, we're trying kind of a new thing on the podcast now, asking everybody that we talk to about their, you know, three questions about their, about their farm and their, and their, uh, well, and themselves and their approach to farming. So what on, on your farm or with, or in your situation, what's your favorite tool? Mm, I, if you, if you, <laughs> I like to, I like to say if, if, you know, if it made any sense to have one tool on a desert Island, which, which, what, what thing would you have? Oh, I don't like that question. I can't, I can't, <laughs> I can't just have one tool, but uh, I did think about it this morning before we started because I have so many favorites and I think that the, my favorite, favorite, favorite is the spading machine. Really? Yeah. So what kind of a spader do you have? I have an Emonts spader from Holland okay. and it's a rotary spader, not a reciprocating spader like the Italian ones. And I've had it for 18 years. I just bought my next, my second one. Uh, the first one lasted 18 years and I got a new one last year. And I think it is, I don't think I would want to farm without it. Why? It's just gives me tremendous flexibility to uh, do primary and secondary tillage in one pass. Right. So it's got a spading piece at the first go and then attached to the back of it is a a harrow, a power harrow. So I'm doing two things at once. I'm doing a very precise amount of ground. No, there's no not like disking where the disc is waggling along behind you, crashing into things. And I know that it's the most gentle way for me to do a job that's, that's biologically damaging. So I know that tillage has a lot of negative consequences on a farm and this is the nicest way I can do it. It's the most gentle and it really ties in beautifully with this high residue kind of farming that we're doing. If with all the cover crops and green manures that we're growing, we were wanting to work this carbon into the ground and there's no better way, no faster, more efficient and gentle way to get all of that residue worked into the six or eight inches of soil that you're influencing. So I think it's a crucial piece of our whole operation. The, 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 the Emmons rotary spader. Yeah, that's okay. the one. <laughs> okay. Great. Ellen, I have a feeling that I know what you're going to say to this because you've already said conferences are your, are your favorite source of information, but is there, is there another place that you like to turn to besides conferences or a favorite conference that you'd like to call out? Uh, as your favorite resource? Well, for me, it's sort of the combination of conference and then the people that you meet at the conference. So the conference is really, uh, are the, really the places where I'm introduced to a new cast of characters or a new uh, perspective. And then it's following up with that person, whether it's through reading or through a direct conversation. So it's a combo pack of the conference and the person. Um, the conference that I'm the most dedicated to and where most of my influence has come from is the Southern SOG conference that's somewhere in the southeastern part of the United States uh, in January of every year. Right. And that one moves around yeah. uh, to different different locations. Right. Yeah. So that's my yeah. favorite one. But there, uh, of course, you've got to have people you can call or email. And so Again, whether it's the people that you're listening to at the conference or the people that you end up having lunch with, having that cast of characters that you can draw upon uh, for advice on the fly is just invaluable. So you need to develop what we used to say, a really good Rolodex. But now, of course, it's your, you know, your contacts on your Gmail. (laughs) You're good. good. You got to develop a good iPhone. That's right. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, all right. And then, and then one last question here, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? What, what would that be? I think it would be this piece that we mentioned today, Chris, about 
combining the soil chemistry and the soil biology and getting working on both of them at the same time, instead of thinking I could do one or the other. For too long in my career, I thought if I just take care of the microbes, everything's going to be okay. If I just make really good compost, that's going to be good enough. And it's really, really good. But I wished that I had mastered integrating this this soil chemistry piece into my management style sooner. That's one thing I would say. Can I say two? Can I say two things? No. Yes, but I, let me let me no, I'm going to I'm going to let you but but let's let me follow up on this one first is where would you where would you send somebody if 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 uh you know if you were talking to your beginning farmer self today um where would you send her to say here's here's the here's the key place to go to learn about the soil biology and the soil chemistry and how to make that work. There's a few really good books. One of them I'm looking at right here is called Building Soils for Better Crops. That comes from uh, Sarah is a really good book. Um, For me, it was a Gary Zimmer book called The Biological Farmer that really put all those pieces together for me. There's a number of good books out there with usually some good speakers around it. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. And what's the second thing now? Because we we will let you since you since you traveled back in time now, we may as well let you have more than just 30 seconds to talk to your beginning farmer. So thank you. And the other one would be go get a good therapist. Right off the bat, because I I like it, I like it. Yes. So because part of the, the hardest, some of the hardest parts of this business are around people management and working with others. And I, I feel like if I'd have gone and gotten some help with my own stuff way back when I would have been a much better manager from the beginning. That's what I would say. And and I think that's so important what you just said. I mean, it's, it's, it's not about learning how to learning how to manage people and the techniques and the philosophies that you can apply to that, I think are really important, but it's also just getting over your own. Yes, exactly. Right. You, (laughs) you've got, you've got to get over yourself in order to have, to be able to have, and you really are relying, I think in a way that you don't, if you have a job and a way that you don't just in a relationship with, with one person, um, you really are relying on those interpersonal skills are such a critical element. Yep. And it's, I love it. I love it. It's about not, love it. not taking it personally, which of yeah. takes your whole life to get really good at. But I wished I'd have started way back when. Yeah. God, I probably need to go talk to my therapist about that yes, too. Don't you I? probably do. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great. Ellen, I've really enjoyed our conversation today. It's fantastic to be able to, to, connect with you again. Thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. It's really been fun talking to you, Chris. So listeners, if you don't already know, you can find links to um, all of the, well, as many of the things as I can manage to to find here. There's a a big list here uh, in everything we mentioned in today's episode by going to the farmer to farmer podcast website. So that's at farmer to farmer podcast.com and searching for Paula shock. And I'm going to tell you how to spell that because this is one you got to know is P O L I S H U K. So well done. Ellen, <laughs> Ellen, thank you again so much for generously sharing your time and your expertise with us today. Thank you. It's been wonderful. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'm going to say again that this is episode 10 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast and that you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or you can just search for Paula Shuck. That's P-O-L-I-S-H-U-K. If you're not already listening to this show on iTunes, Stitcher or the podcast app of your choice, I encourage you to subscribe to get new episodes just as soon as they're released. And I want to thank everyone who has taken time to leave the ratings and reviews that you have on iTunes. The more fresh comments we get, the higher it drives the show in the iTunes rating, which really does make a difference in how many people this show reaches. If you like what you hear here, please consider giving us a review. Also, if you like what you hear here, please think about signing up for my newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga, at the farmer to farmer podcast.com or purplepitchfork.com. 
And one more thing, if you've hung on this long, I'd really like to know what questions you, my listeners, have that my guests or I might be able to answer in the podcast. Please let me know on Facebook at Purple Pitchfork or use the contact page on farmer to farmer podcast.com. Anything about farming and farm life is fair game. I mean, you heard us talking about everything today from soil microbes, compost application rates, all the way to therapists. Okay. So if you want to be anonymous, just let me know. I won't mention your name on the air. And if we choose your question to use on the air i'll even send you a farm to farmer podcast mod okay now i know how to turn this thing off oh yep there 